everyone. So today we are going to talk about a power, a super power, I guess you could say, that God has given us. And this is a power that I think many times we either take for granted or we try to argue that we don't even have. And we say, well, God does this for us, and so we don't have that ability or whatever we might say or that the fate decides or whatever it might be. And if you might already kind of be figuring out what it is we're going on, what I'm going to talk about, but to simplify it, I'm going to start at a more simplistic level that kids can understand and work our way up to a more theological discussion. So you'll be able to understand that at different points during this video, at different angles and things like that, we're going to be kind of upgrading our conversation. But first, we're going to start with that basic. What is this superpower? What is this ability that we have? And to help us understand that, I'm going to use this book. Now, this book here was a book that my son Lincoln got when he turned four. And it says, what should Danny do? Yeah, he's in the background. You might hear her giggling. This is a book that is really cool. It's a book that helps kids understand that their choices have power. And uh, the best way, I think, to explain it is to let my son explain it. So, I'm going to have my son come up and maybe I'll use a little bit of a uh, super snap power. You ready? I'm going to switch this book out for Lincoln. Oh. <laughs> ah, you made it, Lincoln. But uh, we're missing the book now. Should we get the book? Let's see. All right. You hold your hands out. I'm going to snap my fingers. Yeah. And the book's going to appear. Wow. All right. Awesome. Okay. So, what should Danny do? What's his power? Uh, he can choose. Yeah, he has the power to choose. Actually, I was, let's read the first part of this book. Um... Okay, so it says something like, you may be wondering why I'm wearing a cape, so I'll let you in on my secret. I'm a superhero in training. That means I have some superpowers, but I'm still working on the rest. So then he goes through his superpowers that he can jump super high on a trampoline, he can run super fast, he has super muscles carrying in the groceries. But then, down here it says, today is a special day because you'll be making choices for me. When you get the end of the day, you can start over and make different choices. Then we'll see if the power to choose really does change my day. Because over on the front, which I forgot to read, it says, Daddy says that my most important superpower of all is my power to choose. With this power, I can change my day by changing my choices. He even gives me the coolest cape so that I won't forget. This book, in its most simple form, is showing and sharing that we have what is called free will. You ever heard of free will before? No. No? Do you know free will and the power to choose is the same thing? Yeah! Wasn't that crazy? Yeah! All right, so we have the power to choose. Did you know you have the power to choose? <laughs> you do have the power to choose. So let's get an example. So. We have, um, you can, okay, mommy says that you can have a cookie after dinner. Now, you can choose to say, yes, mommy, and eat all your dinner and then get your cookie. Or you can choose to be really grumpy and upset and get angry because you didn't get your cookie now. And if you choose that, what will happen? Or you can eat five bites. Yeah, if you eat your dinner, then you get your cookie. But if you choose to be angry and grumpy, what do you think will happen? I don't know. Do you think you'll get in trouble? Yes. Do you think you'll get your cookie? No. No. If you eat five bites, then you can get, get your <laughs> cookie. Usually we talk about eating five bites to get your food, yes. After you've already eaten other stuff. So you have the power to choose. You have the power to choose whether or not... You are okay with the rules that mommy and daddy give you, or to be <coughs> upset. And in that sense, <coughs> sorry, we got allergies today, don't we? Sneezy, sneezy. Yep. Well, you have the you have the power to choose whether or not 
what we ask you to do, you do, or you can get upset and then sometimes get consequences for it. So, we do have the power to choose. Do you agree with me? Yeah. yeah. All right, you ready to go? Yeah. All right, Lincoln, say bye to the camera. Bye. Oh, it looks like he, uh, he left, but he, he left his book. I guess so. We should get rid of that, too. Ready? Oh, <laughs> the book's gone. All right, so we have the power to choose. We have free will. This all started from the first choice God gave us. Back in Genesis, we look at the story of Adam and Eve. And if you think, remember that story and you read that story, you see that God has given them a choice. This helps separate us between us as humans, as made in the image of God, versus cats and dogs and insects and fish and things like that, other animals. God has given us the power to choose. Yes, animals have a, a choice, but it's very instinctual. It kind of goes with their nature. They choose to hunt because that's what they eat. They choose to forage because that's how they get their food. They choose to, to create hierarchical groups in their order and their clans and things like that because that is how they are made. But we as humans, we live in very different ways. If you look at different cultures, the way they live and the way they interact and the way they see different leaders and different ages and different ways are all different because we have the power to choose. We have free will. It was given. It was given at the beginning because God said, you may eat from anything in the garden, from any tree in the garden. You could eat the apples and the pears and the oranges and the whatever it might be. You may eat any of those foods. They are good to eat. But there's one tree in the middle of the garden. He probably said the middle of the garden because it was probably a, a tree you would know. It's You don't accidentally eat from it. You know that this tree in the middle of the garden is the one tree you must not eat from. It is the tree of the knowledge of of good and evil. It says, if you eat from it, you will surely die. And so he set uh, in this garden, these trees that they could eat. He encourages to eat from the tree of life. And he encourages people to eat, Adam and Eve and his, their kids to eat from all these other fruits and vegetables and things like that. These plants in the garden. He says, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or you will surely die. Now, then it shortly afterwards says that Adam and Eve both ate from it. Now, we don't know how long that was. It was very short in the story, but of course it could have been many, many years between. So they were living in harmony and they chose not to eat from it. And then one day, because of Satan's influences, because of the serpent's influences, Eve decided to eat from this fruit. And Adam was right there and, uh, and was okay with it and then ate from it as well. They were both convinced to eat from it. And in doing so, they died. Now, they didn't die initially. They didn't die with a snap of a finger, you know, like we were doing with the little magic tricks here. They started to spiritually die. They were separated now from God. God wasn't going to be walking with them in the garden anymore in the cool of the day, like it said in scriptures. He didn't walk alongside them. He didn't have conversations with them because they were now impure. Because they had sinned. God had given them a choice. And they chose to not follow it. We all have choices. And we choose whether or not we want to follow the good or the bad. The selfish or the selfless. The appropriate to help bring about the glory of God. Or the inappropriate to bring about our own glory or selfish ambitions. It might be as simple as eating your dinner so that you can have your dessert, or not stealing the cookie from the cookie jar, or it might get more complicated. But God has given us the power of choice. Now let's think a little bit deeper. Okay, it's not necessarily just about eating cookies or finishing your dinner, of course. If we look more uh, into an adult life or a teenager life, uh, we have 
more choices. We have the choice to choose whether or not uh, we, we listen to curfew uh, as, as a teenager, whether we actually come home when we are asked to come home or we call whenever our parents say, yes, if you're going to be late, you call. We have those choices. Now, to choose whether to listen to your parents or not to listen to your parents is a choice. Now, of course, we know that if we don't choose what we are supposed to choose, there are going to be consequences negative consequences usually every choice has a consequence it's a good consequence or a bad consequence sometimes if we choose to listen to our parents the good consequence is our curfew is extended if we choose not to listen to our parents well our, usually our consequence is our curfew is uh, non-existent <laughs> Uh, we could move on to more of an adult life and to our work schedule. It's the same thing. You know, our bosses call us to uh, do certain things. You know, we're supposed to be there on time. We're supposed to do a certain job and things like that. We have the choice to listen or not listen. But, of course, every choice has its own consequences. One choice might be uh, promotion or a raise. Another choice might end up with... Uh, no promotion, no raise, and no job. That is our power to choose. Let's go into our personal life. We have the choice to be a good, decent human being or an absolute jerk. We see that a lot, especially on social media, where we have these choices, where we have this information that we can choose to share. and It might be true, but how? Do we share it with the utmost respect and honor and love, or do we share it out of anger and frustration and self-righteousness? Do we say, hey, here are the truths. I, I beg you to look at it. These are important and it'll help you grow and help you be a better person. Or, hey, look at me and all the things I know. I'm going to throw it in your face. Now, there might not be any losing... Uh, a job or losing curfew privileges over that but I don't know about you but I do not care again this is my own choice but I do not care if the information you share with me is 100% true if you share it in a self-righteous angry bitter frustrated I'm better than you attitude I don't care what the truth is I'm going to have a really hard time listening, processing, and absorbing that information. The way we choose to live life, the way we choose to use our will freely in an appropriate way can make or break the difference between someone listening to the truth or denying it. We have free will. Let's dig a little bit deeper. We look at free will... Of course, I think our first thoughts are, are the garden, like we just said. Uh, God gave us the choice to choose between uh, listening to him or not listening to him. And there were consequences, consequences to that. Then we jump all the way to the uh, other end of the spectrum. We're in Genesis, and a lot of times we'll jump to Revelation. We'll go, well, there's this scripture that says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him. And he with me. Now, we can never take something out of context. We can't just take one verse and go, well, that's what it is. So we got to look back. This is when he's talking to the church of Laodicea in Revelation 2. And if you remember, he didn't look too fondly on the church of Laodicea because the church was what he would consider lukewarm. Lukewarm, if you've listened to one of my tidbit videos, is talking about how it's neither hot nor cold. I don't know about you, but there's very few things, so I can't really think of anything, that I want lukewarm. Ice cream. I want it cold. Coffee. Well, it could either be hot or cold. But very rarely do you want lukewarm coffee. That's that coffee that, like, is kind of that weird room temperature where it's just kind of like the same warmth as, well, I'm going to get gross here, the same warmth temperature as your saliva. Oh. <laughs> Not that exciting. Water. <laughs> I either want hot water for something like tea or to cook something. Or I want cold water. Ice cold water on a hot summer day. Oh, that's, that's great. I don't want lukewarm. Now, I'll drink it if I need to. 
but it does not satisfy. And so God is saying, I, I don't want you to be lukewarm. I want you to be hot or cold. And then he says, uh, you have this idea, say, I am rich and have become wealthy and need them nothing. And so he's talking about Laodicea, the people that say, I don't need God because I have everything I need. I have all these earthly possessions. And he said, no, no, that's not the important thing. You do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And he says, get rid of that gold, that riches that you say you have, and instead bring in the riches, the spiritual riches of my life, of God, God's riches that he's given us clothe ourselves in white to cover our sin naked nature and then he gets to that point of saying i love people and in loving them i reprove and discipline them he said i love you church of laodicea and so i am reproving i am disciplining you out of love like i said before when we do things we need to do it in love and then he says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. We are given the choice to choose whether we want to follow Jesus. We see that in Romans. We see that in Matthew and Mark and Luke when Jesus is talking to people. Actually, I got the passage in, in Mark here. Uh, here it is at Mark eight thirty four. And he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Forever wishes to save his life will lose it, but forever loses his life for my sake, for Jesus' sake, and the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for? For his soul, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. We have a choice. A choice. Actually, it says in Luke even more, uh, it's the same situation. And, and Jesus is saying, deny yourself, take up your cross. And he says, daily to follow him. We have the choice. We could choose to follow him daily. We could choose to not deny our own sinful desires and instead follow him. Or we could cho choose to follow the riches of the world. Now, I don't know about you, but we read all over the place in the Bible that the riches of the world will not last. But the riches of God will last. So we have a choice. We can choose God or ourselves. Which do we want to choose? And if you want even more reason to understand that uh, we have free will choice, First Timothy 2, verse 4. It says, for, well, actually, I'm going to go to verse 3. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So often I hear people say, we don't have a choice. We're either chosen to be saved or not be saved. It is what it is. We don't have free will. We've been predestined. Yeah, we have been predestined, but that's a whole different story, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But we have been given a choice because God desires all to come to the knowledge of him. He wouldn't need to desire all to come to the knowledge of him if he had already picked and chosen. Picked and choose? Pick, picked and chosen? Picked and chosen who would be saved. If he had already picked those people, then he wouldn't desire all because he had already picked them. There's no reason to desire for everyone if he already chosen who was going to be with him or not. We have a choice, and that's the ultimate power God has given us to choose. God is the most powerful being anything in the entire universe and he has given us the choice to follow him or not i i don't know if you fully understand that but the more i live the more i see those choices in our lives the more i am just honored i'm honored that god has given us the choice to choose that god has given us that power to have free will. 
He desires us all to come to the knowledge of him. But we also have a choice. So what are you going to choose? Now, if you stuck with me this long, I really hope you stick with me to the end. Because now I want to get even deeper. We've talked about how we've been given the power to choose. Our superpower is the power to choose. God has given us so many attributes of him and one of them is that. We have the choice to listen to him, to not listen to him, to follow him, to not follow him, to, to live a life out of selfishness or selflessness. I've said that over and over. I don't want to repeat myself, which I already have. <laughs> But now we get to the nitty gritty. We get to the arguments. Again, like I said previously, we have these people out there. I don't want to put a label to them, but they have this view that we don't have a choice. That God has already set the cogs and the wheels in motion for some of us and others, not so much. So some of us, we are being given the chance of salvation and others, well, we've actually kind of been forced at salvation and others not it's called predestination and they like to take scriptures and say well it says we've been predestined and one of those scriptures is in ephesians the beginning of ephesians it's, it's a long one so just bear with me uh but if you want to turn to that it's ephesians 1 just go to ephesians 1 uh, galatians ephesians philippians it's between galatians and philippians very easy to find this is paul writing to the church at ephesus it says, to the saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ Jesus. But, like I said before, if you've read any of my stuff on Ephesians, that term added, Ephesus was added later. So, if you really want to look at this, this letter is to just Christians in general. It's not necessarily to Ephesus. Now, it might have been ended up at Ephesus, but of course this is to everyone, which includes us. We really need to read this. It says, blessed, this is verse 3 of, of Ephesians 1, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Those are the things that God has given us from the beginning. Verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. All right, that's the first uh, verse that, these people like to use and say, well, it says he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. You know what? That's true. Because he wants us all to be saved, just like it said in um, 2 Timothy. No, 1 Timothy? 1 Timothy 2. It says that, that he desires all men to come to the knowledge of him. Of course, he chose us in him, in Jesus, as the him, before the foundation of the world, we'd be holy and blameless before him in love. He chose Jesus to die before anything was ever created. He knew what would happen. He foreknew it. And he said, all right, Jesus, you are going to sacrifice yourself to give everyone a chance at salvation. But even more so, Everyone who is born will have the chance to choose. Will have the chance to live a perfect life or follow in their own selfish desires. And we know there's only one person in the entire history of everything that has chosen God from the beginning. And that is Jesus Christ. Beyond that, we have all chosen at one point to not follow what God calls us to do. So of course, he has given us the ability to choose. He has given us the ability to be perfect and blameless when we are born. And then later we choose to not follow him. So that verse doesn't work for their predestination view. But then he said, whoa, well, verse five, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Christ Jesus to himself according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Alright, it says he predestined us to adoptions as sons through Jesus. Yeah, he has. Because if you take the first 
verse 4 and verse 5 and verse 6 and put them together, which means don't read it out of context. It's saying God chose Jesus before the foundation of the world to sacrifice himself so that we have a chance to be saved. So, he predestined us to have the ability to be saved through Jesus' sacrifice. To the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. He's saying, God freely gave himself as Jesus Christ as a sacrifice, as a gift of salvation that we must accept. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. And then he said, just to make sure that you knew it, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. Even in the Old Testament, Isaiah has talked about the gospel of the Old Testament. When you look at all the Old Testament, all the ideas of sacrifices and things like that, it's all been piling up to say that Usu Jesus is. He is our ultimate sacrifice. He is the ultimate chance to be saved because it is all because of Jesus. He made known to us the mystery. With a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth, and him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also... Oh, oh I won't get that far. We were reading all of this section. And it says predestined over and over and over again. But it's saying he predestined Jesus' sacrifice. He predestined the ability for Jesus to be our chance at salvation. He predestined us to have the choice to have to choose that gift. He didn't force it on us. He gave it to us. Just like any gift you have, you have the choice to receive it or not. You have the choice to be thankful of it, to, to show gratitude for it, or to throw it aside. God has predestined Jesus from the beginning for us because he foreknew and then predestined. We'll talk about that. That's in Romans. Because then it says, for uh, in him, in Jesus, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of our salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. All that fancy word is to say, God set things in motion for Jesus to die, to give us a chance at salvation. And these people in Ephesus, including us, including all the other Christians who read it, all those people who chose to listen to that message and chose to follow Jesus are now, quote, sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. We have chosen to follow him. We have put our whole faith, our whole life in him. We have chosen to do what he has called us to do. We have been immersed into Christ through not only our words, but through what we show in our baptism and in our life and how we live, not in the sense that works save us, but in the sense that we are showing our faithfulness through our works. And in doing so, we have been sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Not because he forced it. Not because he chose Luke to be saved and Joe over here not to be and Susie over here to be and I don't know, you name another name, Kamalka, I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't matter. He didn't choose each person. He didn't flip a coin and say, all right, well, who's going to win the lottery today? No, he predestined Jesus to be a salvation sacrifice for us, a gift for us that we then have all the power to choose whether to follow or not. Because then, we look at Romans 8, 
verse 29. We'll go to 28. So we look at this, we say, well, well, it says in Ephesians, he predestined us, but look at the whole Bible. We can't just pick and choose one little thing out of the Bible. We have to look at the whole Bible because then in Romans 8, Verse 28, it says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God to those who are according, called according to his purpose. And so we look at that and we say, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those who pre he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. We are predestined to salvation if you want to say we're predestined all of us are predestined to salvation because all of us are predestined to have the choice to choose jesus because we jesus was predestined from the foundation of the world to come and sacrifice himself for us and it says in romans 8 that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son because god foreknew he knew from the beginning who would choose to say yes to his gift of salvation and he knew those people so he predestined those to be conformed to the image of his son that he, that he would be the firstborn among many brethren those he predestined so those who chose to follow jesus he also called those he called he also justified those he justified he also glorified these people were not justified and glorified because they won the lottery, because they won the flip of the coin, because they happened to be born in the perfect circumstances. They won the lottery of predestination because they decided to follow Jesus, who was predestined in the first place. <sighs> Sorry, I'm getting a little worked up here. We have the power to choose. We have the ability of free will. God said, I love you. You are made in my image. I want you to have the best life possible. And it only can be the best life possible if you choose it. Think about that. Think about how much better our lives are because we get to choose our lives. Now, choices again have consequences, both good and bad. We have been given the free will choice. We can choose to follow God. Our consequence is a relationship with him. And when we die, we live with him because we choose to be with him or we choose not to follow God we choose to follow another religion or our own selves or just the world in general we choose not to follow God so then God has given us has granted us with that choice he says okay you don't want to follow me then I am not with you because you choose not to be with me and so when you die then you choose not to live eternally with him what is hell living eternally separated from god what is heaven living eternally with god whose choice is that yours it's not meant to be scary it's meant to be loving he wants you to choose he wants you to choose him of course but he still loves you enough and wants you to choose. So, our free will, our ultimate supernatural gift we've been given is to choose our lives. So I'm going to ask you, what do you choose? If you have any questions, Feel free to email me or message me on YouTube or Facebook or whatever. I pray and I hope that we all, just as God desires, that we all choose him. But he has given us that choice.
And if we do choose to follow him, what choices are we going to make to share that message with others? Like I've said over and over again, we have the choice to share Jesus and to show his love.